Development policy, development assistance, and public policy more generally are ready for a redesign based on a more realistic understanding of how human beings think, behave, decide. In the standard approach, what governments typically do is set up institutions, create rules of the game, provide resources, affect prices through taxes and subsidies, and then step back and let people navigate their own course through life. In many respects, that's quite appropriate and it's very powerful, but it's also um, in some ways incomplete. And to understand a little bit about why it's incomplete, I wanna start with a metaphor, which is flying an airplane. It's not something I have ever done. It's uh, a challenging, vertiginous kind of task, especially so if you are in a cockpit that looks like this, this is taken from a plane designed in the 1960s. For technological reasons, each piece of information was mapped to a single dial, altitude, wind speed, air pressure, temperature. It was up to the pilot to visually scan all this information, to remember what it said a few minutes ago, and then make a decision, like choosing an angle of approach for a runway. This was linked to pilot error, and so as a result, experts in the area of human factors design were called in. Modern cockpits now look like this. They allow pilots to set certain information to be displayed as a default and hide other bits of information. They're less cognitively demanding, they're easier to fly, and pilot error has gone down. It's also true that social relations in the cockpit matter. Studies have shown that typically captains issue twice as many orders as first officers, even though first officers are sitting in the cockpit, and that first officers tend to issue their orders as suggestions. Sir, you might want to lower your wheels now. <laughs> you can understand why the free flow of information is very important. In 2013, the American Heart Association came out with a study that found that social hierarchy in the operating room is also linked to surgical error on the part of cardiac surgeons. Being on the same page in the operating room is also important. It's important for people in that room to have the same mental model that's also linked to lower rates of, of surgical error. So if we can redesign the cockpit for pilots so that they can navigate better, we should be able to do the same for individuals as they navigate their course through their lives. Too much information can be overwhelming. Redesigning the information environment, the social environment can help people make better decisions about their education, about their savings, about their health care, and about a variety of other domains of life as well. In uh, tr traditional development policy, the assumption was that people make decisions deliberatively on the basis of consistent and self-interested preferences and explicit information. In the report, we argue that we need to rethink how people decide and behave. People think automatically. They usually draw on what comes to mind effortlessly. They think socially. We're deeply social beings, and social norms guide much of our behavior. And finally, we think with mental models. Information coming in is filtered through our conception of the world and of ourselves. It's important to keep in mind. In this context, people realize the stakes are high. Airbus, Boeing, they realized that when the design environment isn't right for pilots, crashes can occur, and that's a high stakes situation. So they redesigned the cockpit. Now, people coming to this talk probably know that development is also a high stakes situation. Global poverty is a very high stakes situation. There are over 13 million preventable deaths that take place every year, more than half of those among kids under the age of five. So it's incumbent upon all of us, those who work in government, in civil society, for donor organizations, to help redesign the choice environment to help people make decisions in their own best interests. Actually, using the example of the cockpit, one of the criticisms made of this area sometimes, it's actually so many different effects and so on and so on. It's quite hard to kind of get a, a grip on. Is, is there an effect or result which is particularly striking in your mind, because you've been so familiar with it now, where you kind of stood out and you think, that really is absolutely amazing. Is, do you have a favorite? Well, I came across one the other day, David, which I hadn't known, which really jumped out at me, partly because it's from, uh, it contradicts or is different than a standard economic uh, prediction, which is that um, British Columbia implemented a carbon tax I believe in 2008 or 2009. And if you think about the impact of a carbon tax, um, you would predict a relatively small drop in consumption given the, carbon, the size of the carbon tax that they imposed. But the result was seven times larger than the predicted effect based on just a price increase. So what that means is that all the conversation about what was going on really changed 
how people were behaving and, 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 and acting. And so even in a basic standard area like price elasticity that economists talk about, there's something more going on. We don't know exactly you know, what the elasticity is going to be of a carbon tax, but it really jumped out at me as thinking we need to really rethink some fundamental assumptions that we have. <laughs>